So guys, I'm sitting here editing the video and I just realized that I probably should do a little disclaimer at the very beginning of this because this is not a review video. This is just basically talking about what I love about this knife, uh, the John Grimsmo, the Grimsmo Brothers Norseman. So I've already done review videos about the knife, so I just figured it would make sense for me to just talk about what it is about the knife that makes it so great. There's no specs. There's none of that. It's just basically us walking through the knife and just be... Just be wary. This is a longer video. You might have to watch it in two sittings. It's about 30 minutes. I don't have to say anything else. You guys know what this video is going to be about. If you're wearing headphones, turn down the volume because here comes some music. You guys know, for years I have talked about how I have lusted after a Grimsmo Norseman. So, once everything started to fall in place, I had been saving for years, literally years, saving $20 here, $10 there, change, anything I could, and I scrolled it away and I made myself a fund for one of these. Now, I've had the money for a while, it, you know, 20 bucks here and there, it, it stacks up. And that's why I get upset when people say that, oh, I bought a clone because I can't, I couldn't ever afford one of these. It's just like anything else. If you're patient, you save, things can come up that get in the way so you eventually can do what you want. If you want something, save for it. That's why I don't own any clones. Um, but so I saved and 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 I finally once we sold this house and then we had that windfall of money and things were starting to happen where I was able to know that things were getting better financially with the business and all that, I went ahead and I found one. I found the exact one I wanted. It's not brand new. It is used. But I got one and I kind of wanted to just do a video. We're going to go through some of the things that I feel make it justifiable to purchase such an expensive item and why I won't ever get rid of it, and why I, the things about it that I really love. So, yeah, guys, that's it. We're gonna go turn this around, and we're just gonna look at this knife real close. Now, I'm not sure I'm gonna take it apart because I actually did clean it up and reassemble it and, and everything, and lock tighted the pivot, because p pivots do walk loose, and I just wanted to make sure, even on knives like this, will walk loose. And so I just wanted to make sure that it was exactly the way I wanted it once I got it cleaned up, got the action where I was at. So uh, probably not gonna take it apart, but I'm gonna explain some of the internal workings to you so that you have an understanding of why they're just so, such precision knives. So meet you down at the uh, microfiber cloth. All right, guys. So if you guys have never seen one of my videos about the Grimsmo Norseman, you wouldn't know that I truly, truly, truly love this knife. Not a lot of people are not a fan of the blade shape. Sorry for the shaking. I'm trying to adjust this. Hang on but just I a want to give myself a little more altitude so it's easier to work around this tripod. So I've wanted one of these knives since the first time I saw John making one. I found one that had all the bells and whistles of what I wanted. The pocket clip does rattle, but that's, I don't think that's, I think that's a me thing. I think I'm doing that. Uh, these are basically custom knives. Every element of this knife is made in-house with the exception of the ceramic balls that he uses in the bearings. However, the bearing races are made by John and Eric and the guys at, at, at Crimson Knives. Now, I started following these guys when they were still making them in their garage before they even got the shop, the first shop. And the trials and tribulations of him dealing with the machining. So the one that I wanted, I've always wanted the reverse honeycomb and just a plain standard. And I love the pocket clips. I love the logo. So I went ahead. This has been re-anodized by me. This knife will never, in all likelihood, never go anywhere. This will be mine forever. So some of the elements of this knife. One, this knife has the gold standard for drop shut. Like people talk about their knives being drop shut. I didn't mean to, to flip it like that, but people talk about their knives being drop shut. And a lot of knives are. And I have a couple knives over here that I'm going to talk about that are drop shut. But when I say this is drop shut and being the gold standard of drop shut, there is nothing 
You cannot feel anything in that. Like there's no shake. It actually drops shuts so readily that it hits the backstop pin. If you if you uh, let it drop all the way, if you guys watch, let's nudge it past that little. It drops so hard that it comes out of detent and then goes back in. Uh, all the machining and things like that are done so so well, and then the fit and finish is just like there's no flaws in this knife. There are none. Anything that's wrong with this knife is stuff that other people have done to it, previous owners and myself. Um, the the way, the, the softness, I mean, when you pick this up, you're like, oh, wow. Like you hold it and you're like, holy crap, that is so well done. And like I said that there are other knives that have false shut action. We may, we may take this, like this knife. This knife has an incredible false shut action. However, as it falls, you can feel the bearings moving and you can feel pinch points and things happening. Now, it, it's this is an incredibly good knife. Uh, this is actually one of my favorite knives in my collection. It is an incredibly good, smooth, well-done knife, but it does fall shut, yes, but I can feel, I can feel friction in that. I can feel the bearings moving and things like that. I don't feel that in this. Um, and just, do <laughs> you see that? Just the way it looks. Everybody's like, oh, you should have, you could have got a rasp, you could have got that. The blade shape. This is what throws a lot of people off. I've always been a big fan of this blade shape. I, I love this knife. And I had a lot, I have a love hate with sharpening this knife, but this is my knife and it has my edge and it is screaming, hair whittling, curly, cut and curly cues off of a hair kind of sharp. Uh, because this thing is, it's not ground. I was getting ready to say ground so thin. The edge profile behind this off of the machine is so thin. It's, it's so well done in, down in this recurve that it cuts so well. And then you have this big beefy tip. There's no chance I'm ever going to break this. You have this big beefy tip that has some belly on it. So it's like having two knives in one. It's like having a recurve for doing some heavy cutting. You've got that recurved edge. And then you have this this forward convex edge that if you need to put something down on a table and, and go like that and cut it, you can. And as a matter of fact, this knife is so sharp that I was wiping it down and I almost cut myself because it cut almost all the way through my microfiber, my Chris Reeves microfiber. And all I was doing was wiping the knife off. So it takes an incredible edge, incredible, incredible edge. And a, a lot of people don't like the RWL 34. But it's an, it's, I love it. I love the steel. I always have. I like damn steel. I like how fine of an edge it takes. And just so you guys know, <laughs> that's only a thousand grit edge. RWL 34 is another one of those steels that will take a super high polish at a lower grit. And it, it's so grabby and toothy, even though it's so polished. It just, it just wants to peel the skin right off of you. It will cut you so easily. Um, so other things about the knife, uh, just how well all the markings are done. So clean, so consistent, so crisp. You can see those the lettering on it. Each one's individually serialized. And he uses, as opposed to, let me see if I can zoom in on it. As opposed to a, a standard detent ball, can you see that right there? What that is, is that's a flat-faced detent. And what that allows it is, it's so smooth it allows him to have a weaker lock bar tension, which the lock bar tension on this is next to nothing. I've never had it slip. I've never accidentally disengaged it, but there's almost no lock bar tension on that at all. And it just, it's so smooth, but it fires so well because instead of that ball being rounded and allowing that, that blade to kind of ramp up out like that, so you get your detent ball and it kind of ramps up, it's not, it's stuck in there and it has to snap past that pocket yeah, I know, guys. It has to it has to snap past that pocket uh, because it's got that hard edge instead of being rounded where it gently ramps up. So you don't get any, there's just nothing in it and it fires. So this is one of the, this is one of the things I have been stoked about the most. And I'm going to tell you why I got this one. One, I didn't have to add a sharpening notch. This was after John had done sharpening notches. The, the improvements that are in this, um, he has done the 
as you can see, there's a, you can start to see it come up there, the ramp where it allows that detent ball to slide out. And so you don't have it hit. It's a, it's just so smooth. There is like, once you unlock that, it doesn't like stick and then pop past. It just, it's ramped it up. He put a, a detent ramp on it. Um, and then the final thing is this has the double stop pin uh, design on it, which I'm not going to take the knife part. Cause like I said, I got it. I got it cleaned up and taken apart and I've dialed the pivot exactly where I want it and lock tighted it. So it won't come loose. Um, after I did the, all the anodizing and everything. So I'm not going to take it apart, but I'm going to explain it to you. So this has two separate detent or it's two separate stop pins. And what that allows you to do is actually, hang on a second. Let me go get something I can kind of explain okay. it. So this is, now, a lot of knife makers do this. So what John does, if you start to get blade play, when your knife is open, what you do is, basically, he will send you an oversized stop pin. Well, a lot of knife makers do that. But what happens in a lot of knives, and I've had to do it on a couple of my Fair and Forge knives, they use an, a different size stop pin. But when you, when you only use one stop pin, this is your open position, and this is your closed position. If you change the diameter of this, you change both of these positions. So that means that then you have to, as I will show you on my uh, end tack here in just a second. I grabbed a couple of them so I could show you. So if you, if you change the open position with a single pin, you then have to change the closed position because if you expand this diameter, now the lock bar is not going to marry up. So what you have to do, and you can see I've done it because I'm the one that did the oversized stop pin on this. I had to take material out of the stop pin position and off of the lock face to allow that knife, when it's in the closed position, to actually locate the detent hole. So you slowly have to take off that material because if you're changing this at all with only one pin, you're changing both positions. So that means that now that it's larger in the open position, your, your knife will not close properly. It won't drop into the detent hole because that diameter of that stop pin, which also closes, changes your closed position, changes. And you have to account for that. now. If you are only having issues in the open position and not in the closed position, you're taking, you're taking material off that knife and it's going to, over time, you can see this knife tip is actually a little higher now than it was when I first purchased it because the closed position is still going to be a little bit different and it raises that tip up every time. And you reach a point where that knife might be at a point where it sits, I'm trying to get it up, like that, where you're able to catch it and touch it. Now, I've never had one of my ferrums get that far, but the position of this is slightly different. If you use two stop pins and you need to change the diameter of this, this pin controls your open. This pin sets your closed. So if you change the diameter of this and make it a little larger, you don't have to worry about your stop position. And therefore, what you don't have to do is you don't have to do anything to make sure that that falls back into detent because the second pin closes, controls the lock or the close position on that knife. So it's pretty ingenious that if you're not having problems in the close position, why would you need to change anything on that knife? It just saves time. So all you have to do is you just drop in and it does not affect anything. All it does is it just changes the position at which this blade is going to be at so that it engages your lock bar a little bit better. And it allows you to, to correct issues with this knife without having to send it back to him. If you didn't do that, if he didn't do that, I would have to send this knife to him every time anything happened because he would then have to take material off the lock bar and take material off the inner stop. And so doing that has allowed him some repeatability to where uh, I actually did it for a customer. I had one that had blade play and when I or lock rock. And so what I mean is when in the open position, this knife would wiggle this way and rattle. And so all I did was I got some oversized stop pins from him, threw one in, found the right one that took care of it, which was just the next size up. And it took care of the issue because what happens is over time, these things, these surfaces are going to deform and the surfaces inside here will deform slightly. So there's a chance that at some point I may have to put a, a larger closed pin, closed position pin in, and then I may have to send it to him to 
maybe take material off the lock face or take material out inside because then that may change it. But there's very little stress involved in the closed position. All of that stress that you're gonna have where it may deform comes from this action where it slams up against the larger of the two pins. So pretty genius. Now that we're done talking about that, let's get that out of the way and finish doing some talking about this. This is one of those knives that I consider a lifetime knife. And when I say that, I mean that this is a knife that if you buy this and you never get rid of it, even if you use it daily, this knife will last you a lifetime and probably more. Uh, I have several knives that I, I, a lot of knives that I think fall into that category. Fair and Forge knives being one of them. You, you, they're knives that are going to last a very long time. This is another one of those. And just the sheer attention to detail. Like if you find a flaw on this knife, I don't know where you would find it. The only thing, the only, only thing that I do wish was a little different is, can you see how large that area is? Right there, the open area right there. That could allow stuff to fall in. And I did see a video of, I can't remember who it was, that had actually something get in there and it affected, it affected their lockup. They couldn't get the knife to lock. And all they did was rinse it under a sink. Uh, but as far as anything wrong with this knife, there is none. And I should have, I should take it apart just to show you some of the engraving and things that are inside that just make it special. Those little special touches that John doesn't have to do, but he does. There's a logo inside here. There's a birth date inside here. There's all those things. And like I said, this knife was made in 2018. And it still looks brand new. The only the only wear that is on this knife is wear that I've put on it, really, because it came with a factory edge on it. I use my things. This knife has been used a lot. And I will tell you, this blade shape screams through cardboard almost effortlessly, just pushing right through cardboard. And it's so comfortable. One of the things that I will, and this is why this knife is still out. If you guys watched the video that came out on Tuesday, I'm filming this right after it. This knife is not, it's just, that's a pretty standard thickness. This knife is thinner. It's about the same at the pocket clip as this knife is overall in thickness. And what, what that gives you is this is a really large knife, guys. It's large. I'll get some specs if you want, but I'm going to tell you right now, this is a large knife. So just to give you a point of reference, that's... That is a Endura. That's a Spyderco Endura, which is a large knife. It is a very long knife, and they are just about the same. Um, another point of reference that a lot of people will see uh, that they have a, a standard is a Sabenza. And the Sabenza is actually, usually the Sabenza is the one like, yeah, Sabenza is about an inch longer, half an inch longer, all that. This knife is at least... Uh, half an inch longer. Um, but the fact is, it's the nice thing about it is John was smart enough. This is so thin, but it's also wide here that it carries well. It sits in the pocket nice and smooth, and it doesn't feel too thin. So a lot of times you get these knives that are thin. They just feel awkward in hand, especially I've got really big hands. It just feels awkward in hand. This knife does not. There's enough width to account for the thick, the thinness. So if you're gonna have a thin knife, it's gotta be a little broad. And this knife just basically has everything I would want. And in hand, that curvature puts that knife exactly where I want it to use it. It's, I mean, it is one of the most thought out tools. And if you really need to do some heavy cutting, that big shouldered up area right there, perfect. The blade on it, all machined, CNC machined. You can see the steps, but they don't, add friction. You can barely feel them. Like if you run your thumbnail on it, you, you can feel it, but they don't add any friction. Like I said, all of the markings, super, super well milled. And then just the, the way they come sharpened from the factory, the edge that was on this, while it was a little bit dull, dull super, still super, super crisp and well done. Uh, I did put my own edge on it. You can see like how I marry up those angles, but Everything about this knife, no hot spots. The jimping feels soft to the touch. It doesn't feel like it'd be that sharp, but when you bear down on it, it bites and it's just about perfect. The thumb stud has the thumb stud has got a sharp lip on it that you can see. 
but it doesn't feel sharp because that's not where you're touching. You're touching right here and it takes almost nothing for that knife just to fly open. And if you don't want it to slam shut, you can you can kind of jiggle it at an angle, but it will slam shut. It is a finger guillotine. Uh, this is a knife that I'm gonna do a video, knives that I would be afraid to hand somebody without prior warning. So yeah, guys, I am super, super stoked with this. Lanyard hole, like even a lanyard hole, see how it's been chamfered? If you decide to use a lanyard, you're not gonna cut your lanyard up on it. And then the internally mounted the internally mounted uh, pocket clip, it's, just, it's perfect. There is no wiggle, there's no play. It's just about the right tension for any kind of pair of pants. And it's done attractive and well. The only thing I want to do to this knife is I'm gonna try and see if I can get John to use this same kind of marking and put my military insignia, uh, my rank insignia on the knife up here at the top. Because like I said, that would just ensure this knife never goes anywhere. I can't see a time that I would ever get rid of this knife unless, you know, unless I had had to pay for medical treatments. <laughs> so, yeah, guys, a little bit longer video, but let's turn this around and have some final thoughts on this. As I meant to mention this, the other thing that comes with this, the the packaging, like these guys do their own, <laughs> they do their own cases with the foam inlays. I would like to see them do like the ones that, uh, the tops the way that they do them over at Nowpack, which has the Grimsmo logo on the top too, but hey, still really nice. And then, you know, underneath, it says lift here. And then underneath that, you get your, your certificate of authenticity, which is signed by Eric and, and John both. And so you get to see, now mine was, is no longer silver. It was kind of blue when I got it. Somebody had anodized it. Like I said, I did not purchase this brand new, but like brand new thing of oil. You get your own tool. It's, everything on this is a T9, by the way. So that makes it really easy. Form fit case, Pelican style with their logo on the front. I mean, even just to the detail of that, that is, that's awesome. And now, like I said, there's, this is, in my opinion, one of the gold standards for knives. And I'll, I'll explain that a little bit more when we turn it around. So when I say that this should be the gold standard, I mean, there are so many really good knives out there. But what, J what John and Eric did was they decided, instead of trying to make a lot of really good knives, a bunch of different models, what they did was they focused on this until they had it. I'm gonna tell you guys, this is as perfect as I've ever had a knife. Like, honestly, this is as close to flawless and perfect as I've ever held in my hand. And the second you hold it, you're like, holy crap. Like I have, I've owned this for well over a week and I still get goosebumps all the time because of this knife. And it's not because of the blade shape. Like I could have gotten a rask, uh, but for me, the rask is just another really nice looking knife. Is it machined and, and assembled and the tolerances and things like that that are on it and, and the standards that it's held to, are they well above almost every other knife on the market? Yes. But it's so similar to so many other knives. And the second I saw them make this knife the first time, everybody says, oh, you got the Pelican knife and things like that. I don't care. The fact that this knife is so unique and still so functional and done so incredibly well. I'm gonna tell you guys, this is possibly my favorite knife on the planet. Uh, and, you know, this takes us to something else. A lot of people are like, well, I can't get one. I'll get, a, I'll get a knockoff. I'll get a clone. I'll get this. If you've ever held one of these and, and felt the action and just used it in general and, and carried it, and just felt how it is to try and compare a clone or knockoff to this, it's not gonna happen. Even some of the best ones I've seen, they just don't get it right. Because the fact is, I've talked to Eric and I've watched his videos and I've heard his philosophies. Eric is more about let's get this right than he is about let's get it done and make money. Yes, is he in business to make money? Of course he is, but He's at least thinking to himself, I want to make money, but I want to make money on it and I want it to be as perfect as possible. Are there some minor things? Yeah. I mean, I guarantee like that pocket clip rattle. A lot of people would say, oh, I don't like that. Well, I mean, does it bother me? No, because the pocket clip is, I'm, I'm doing that. That's me doing that. It doesn't do that on its own. 
And does the pivot wiggle loose over time? Yeah, but that's that's a common thing with knives. Do you know what I did? I Loctited it just to make sure it didn't happen. So there are some there are some minor things with any knife, but what John did was they they John and Eric decided that they wanted to bring possibly the best knife to market, and they're doing it. And they're doing it where there's knives that are way more expensive than this that are not this nice. I'm telling you right now, you can pick one of these up for like 900, 950, 1100 bucks, which sounds like a lot of money. And people will like, oh, I can't afford that. I'm going to get a clone. I don't, I do not abide by that philosophy. I saved for almost four years to be able to get this one. Almost four years, three, three and some change. I look back at to when I started putting money in that account. Uh, I didn't use any of the YouTube money. I didn't use any of the Patreon money. That was strictly just, I had a $10 bill in my wallet. I stuck it in an envelope until I had a bunch of them. And then I took them to the bank and I put them in the account. And then once I felt that we were financially comfortable enough, financially stable enough that I could spend that money, I spent it. So I don't want to hear this like, oh, well, I'll just, I can't, I can't afford one of those. I'll get a clone. If you want one, if you want something bad enough, you'll find a way. And it goes back to that, like, how do you eat an elephant? one bite at a time. Yeah, there were times that I had to take money out of that account, but I wasn't willing to compromise because one, buying that's unfair to John. Buying a clone is unfair to John and Eric because what you're doing is you are paying for their time and work to come up with a design for someone just to go back and make a, a, a crappy half-assed copy of it. And basically that's theft of their intellectual property. I don't care how you look at it. I don't care what your take is on it. I don't care if you think it's too expensive. If you think it's too expensive, you just don't buy one. But don't support the clone and knockoff market, please, guys. Especially, these are some of the nicest guys in the world. It comes through on their videos. I've talked to them. I'm hoping to get them. I'm hoping they're going to go Blade Show West. I really want to see them. They're some of the nicest guys in the world that, that I've ever seen. They're just genuine and honest. And the way they treat their customers, the way it, it all comes through in everything that they do. If you've ever corresponded with them, it comes through. You know how they say you can see, you can hear a smile on the phone? You can hear intent of, of someone's personality. You can hear the, the, the way that they interact with you, even through an email. So, guys, like I said, way longer video than usual, but it deserves it. It really does. And we'll do a, we'll do a tear down of this. The next time I have to take this knife apart to clean it or anything like that, we will definitely do a tear down and I can show you all the internal workings of this knife, all the engravings and things like that. It, it really just is amazing all the work that goes into this. And then when you, like when you look at that price point and you think, well, why? And then you get one and you look at it and you're like, that's why. I mean, for God's sakes, guys, he makes his own bearings, races. He makes his own bearing races, his own captured bearings. He does them himself. He buys the balls and he mills the ring himself. Their name is on the bearings. Grimsmo. So there's a lot of time and work and passion that went into that. So all right, guys, that's it. Long video. I apologize. So if you like the videos, give them a thumbs up. If you don't like them, give them a thumbs down, but try to tell me why. I am putting stuff in the corners. You guys should stick around to the end of every video and see who I've linked and go follow their channels and see what they're doing as well. Um, and then, like I said, there, there's there's a link to join down below. There's an applause link where if you really like the videos, you can donate money directly to the channel as opposed to trying to have a membership. I know times are tight and I'm, I'm not begging for money. I'm just saying, if you want to support the channel, I can do more for you if we have more coming into the channel. Uh, that's about it, guys. You guys have a good safe weekend because it is Saturday for me, just like it was in the, uh, the video that you saw on Tuesday of this knife. It is still Saturday for me. Uh, you guys have a good safe weekend. Take care of yourselves and uh, be good to each other. And if you have something to say in the comments about the things that I said about the knockoffs and clones, I have no problem with that. But please do not try to support the clone market on my comments. And please don't be disrespectful to anyone in the comment section. So I love you guys. Take it easy. And I will see you in the next video.